You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options House, a powerful, easy-to-use, and intuitive online trading platform that's not only fast and reliable, but comes with dedicated customer service and a great trading experience. Trade on the platform that's top rated by Barron's and Stockbrokers.com. With completely transparent, value oriented pricing, Options House is your all in one solution for options, futures, and stock trading. Plus, open and fund a new account at OptionsHouse.com slash insider today and trade commission free for 60 days. Options House is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. And now, get ready to hit the option block. All right, everybody. That rock and music means it's time once again for a little program we like to call around these parts, the option block. You may have thought, hey, we, uh, you've, you've got about us. You haven't been doing any shows. Well, that's, of course, because it has been indeed a holiday week here, a truncated holiday week here in the good old U.S. of A. But now we're back and raring to go with some option block Action. So, of course, some education, some unusual activity, some what's trading, some of your questions, a whole heap of your questions, as well as maybe some peering into the future. And you have the heady, delicious brew that is the option block. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Hopefully we can pull you guys away from your Cyber Monday fiendish shopping here to join us live as well via Mixler, M-I-X-L-R. You know the drill every Monday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. You can hear all of our live goodness here. And sometimes not so goodness. <laughs> you hear it all when you're coming in live. You hear how the sausage is made here on the old option block program. And, of course, you can always find us after the fact of iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, so on and so forth. If you like the option block, you can subscribe to this show. If you want to go hardcore, get all the goodness, well, then, of course, uh, the network is where you want to go to get all 15 programs mainlined straight into your ear holes. And, of course, you can always find us as well, the website, options, and the options, excuse me, theoptionsinsider.com, and via all the usual outlets of stock twits and Twitter and all that fun stuff. And joining me on the old program today, let's kick it off. Let's go in order of reverse proximity, because otherwise he gets all umbrage where we are joined <laughs> by a post-turkey, post-triftophan, hazed-induced rock lobster. Actually, what is, what is the, uh, the celebratory dish of Thanksgiving up in Maine. Is it a turkey? Do you indeed all gather around the Thanksgiving lobster instead? <laughs> uh, we do have a lobster. Uh, I actually make lobster mousse out of it. I don't know what other people in Maine do, but that's what I do. Uh, lobsters and uh, tasty clams, actually. It's just a little appetizer. Happy appetizer. Lobster mousse. That sounds, I hope, I hope they don't offend you. That sounds horrible. But then again, I'm not a seafood person nor a mousse person. So you're kind of combining two of my least favorite things into one. So there we go. Lobster well, mousse. It, it clearly is not horrible if that is what we have as an appetizer for Thanksgiving. Although if you come, we will not serve it to you. Although you never know that uh, that rock lobster family, their, their taste buds could be a little bit off. You know, you do live in Maine. Uh, where the water is flavored with lobster juice. So uh, you never know. You never know what you get over there in the hinterlands of Maine. Let's move it a little closer to home, away from the land of, uh, of lobster, lobster moose, <laughs> and towards perhaps a more reasonable 
a Thanksgiving celebration in the paradise on Earth, known as St. Charles, Illinois, where we are joined by Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Wealth Advisors, a.k.a. RCM Futures, a.k.a. RCM Alts, a.k.a. RCM All of the Above. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. How was your festive holiday season, or at least the kickoff to your holiday season, sir? Oh, it was a ton of fun. And Andrew, <clears throat> your lobster moose is welcome at my Thanksgiving table anytime, my friend. There you go. Thank you. Somebody, somebody that has clarity on this subject. I've never had it. It sounds really good. If either, of you, quite tasty. if either of you ever left your little provincial domains, you could share dishes and recipes and have a joint event. But we know Uncle Mike never leaves the, uh, the comfy confines of, uh, of St. Charles and Rock Lobster. Very rarely departs from the Duchy of Maine. He knows the rest of the country doesn't honor that passport. So uh, that, that probably that, that intermixed, commingled meal will unfortunately probably never come to pass. But what will come to pass is the trading block, so let's get right to it. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Trading Block, the part of the show where we break down what was moving, what was shaking, what was catching our eye in today's market activity. Uh, coming off, like I said, the uh, the truncated holiday week and everyone's eyes uh, were, were elsewhere except for the market. They were off on deals, uh, grabbing deals left, right, and center, including today, which is, of course, uh, the made-up holiday of Cyber Monday, following the equally made-up holiday of Black Friday, uh, which, of course, a lot of eyes also focus on the retail segment. Uh, so maybe we'll get into those in a little bit. But, of course, uh, maybe the market taking a little bit of a break today, too, from its extended Trump rally with uh, most of the major indices selling off on the day, the S&P off over half a percent, leading the charge to the downside. The rest of the major indices out there, a little bit more laggards to the downside, only off about a third of a percentage point or so. And all of this, uh, this downside and coming to the end of the, the holiday week as well, getting a little juice back in the old VIX cash, back up over the 13 handle, if ever so slightly ever so briefly up around 13, 15 or so. Still well on the low end of its of its recent range, at least. We, of course, saw uh, some aggressive spikes during the electoral cycle into the low 20s. Uh, so we're far off that. Back into the far more, shall we say, reasonable area of the uh, of the 13 handle. We'll see where we go from there. We don't have any predictions on ball views, at least what well, we do actually, because we predicted two weeks ahead of time. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's turn our attention to see what uh, my cohorts here found intriguing in today's activity. Let's go and reverse umbrage, reverse proximity order uh, this time, or actually proximity order, reverse umbrage order, though, which would be back to uh, the paradise on Earth known as St. Charles, Illinois. Uncle Mike. What caught your eye in today's activity, sir? Uh, besides all the umbrage, uh, I would say you know, we had a pullback today. I think this, I think I had heard somewhere today that this was the longest win streak since 1996, I believe. Uh, so at some point, the market does come down a little bit. Uh, but we are still above the all-time highs that we set uh, last week. And uh, it's definitely uh, still in bull mode overall, in my opinion. Uh, the one thing that we did see today is that the dollar is starting to pull back a little bit. Uh, with that, gold is coming up. And you can argue and make a case for that for uh, whether or not oil is making a run. Uh, I know the big meeting for oil is coming up on Wednesday to see if they're going to uh, actually halt the supply of oil or add to the supply of oil, whatever the case may be. Uh, excuse me, but with that, uh, oil is up uh, close to a dollar on the day. I'm showing it at uh, it's up 85 cents on the day, just under the 47 handle. Uh, so the dollar coming down, I think, is something that has set off uh, some things going on in the in the marketplace. Uh, with the dollar coming down, uh, we also have uh, bonds coming up a little bit. Uh, so, but in terms of what's uh, making the how the sausage is being made overall in today's market, I think a uh, the dollar coming down a little bit is adding to a lot of what's happening. Yeah, the dollar uh, leaning on a few things uh, in this regards, including the market, uh, where we're seeing, again, a little bit of a pronounced, uh, not too pronounced, but mild, shall we say, a sell-off out there on the street, turning our attention to the land, the ducky, <laughs> the ducky. <laughs> Easy for me to say today. I'm still high on my trip to van, apparently, as well. The Duchy of Maine, where they're talking all things Trump bump, or perhaps <laughs> lack thereof. Mr. Rock Lobster, what caught your eye in today's activity, sir? 
I think the show is going to be called The Ducky of Maine. How, how do you really, how I do like you that. improve upon a the show ducky, title? The Ducky of Maine. Started off <laughs> early, we already got a title. We're done, we can go home now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think hunting season is over here shortly, uh, like in a day or two. Um, anyway, um, oh, we have, it's really, well, I guess it's a half a point pullback. What, a half a 1%, half a percent? Uh, considering we've gone up 50 straight handles, maybe since the election, to what was it, 2120 or something like that, and uh, right back up. So I think the market, you know, it should pull back a little bit. What has actually been building a bit, I think, is a lot of commodities. For whatever reason, there's a lot of buyers and in infrastructure commodities. Like I don't know, they're going to find a trillion dollars to build a bunch of stuff. I, I don't know. How that's all going to work? Um, I, th I guess they liked it uh, also for um, for you know maybe in 2009 when they st everybody started buying up those stocks because they thought you know it was that shovel ready President Obama stuff. Are we going to be going <laughs> to be funny and be doing the same thing just with a different guy? But you know ultimately the market thinks this is going to be stocks think this is going to be a more market friendly. Uh, i.e. growth oriented administration and um, if he has time take can take some time from his Twitter feed I guess <laughs> that could be possible so as far as the the day goes I mean it wasn't a hugely exciting day um, we have there's a I think there's an Italian referendum which is kind of a uh, has kind of the same populist sort of uh, uh, leanings that we've had with the Trump election and Brexit. That's the fourth. It, it's The euro was weaker for a while, and it's since kind of stabilized, maybe waiting for that event to happen. So, I mean, there's a couple things on the horizon, but as far as, you know, <clears throat> not a huge vol event day. Vol was up a little bit uh, with the market down a little, so that makes sense. But, I mean, it's hardly a... It was hardly a resounding... Um, you know, sell off. Um, so we'll see how long uh, the good, the uh, good feelings will last. Although I have a feeling they're going to last. The good feelings will keep lasting through December because, you know, unless something drastically changes, whatever's propelled stocks this far is going to probably keep propelling them. Uh, once we see some, once we see some of the fine print on all the great things that are going to happen next year. Yeah, that fine print is uh, always a doozy, as we're learning now with all the post-Brexit stuff. And now, of course, uh, some people starting to question on the heel of today's sell-off and some other events. And maybe this, uh, this post-Trump rally is a wee bit uh, overdone. Uh, some interesting articles coming out here. I think Market Watch had one calling it the Trump bump and saying uh, this Trump bump may be, uh, <laughs> may be this expected influx of, uh, of spending into different areas of the economy may not actually play out the way it, it, you'd think, and in fact, we were doing our long and short of futures options uh, program earlier today, talking to the chief economist over there at the CME, and he was pointing out, you know, a, a fact that makes a perfect sense uh, on the surface. You know, we saw a big rally in certain commodities like copper uh, ahead of this uh, or after this big Trump infrastructure spending surge that has been predicted. Yet you don't use a lot of copper when you're building roads and bridges for the most part. You know, you use it for wiring and other things, but uh, generally it's not a huge copper driver. So we kind of saw these almost reflexive surges into uh, you know, industrial type metals and commodities and things like that, maybe without a lot of a rhyme or reason uh, to that surge. So maybe, who knows, maybe maybe this uh, there is something to this and this fact that this uh, this Trump bump, this Trump surge, this, this call it what you will, is a wee bit overdone. I don't know, as the as the diehard libertarian out there, Mr. Rock Lobster, holding down the flag in the in the libertarian duchy of Maine, uh, what, what say you to this notion that perhaps all this... Um, Trump hysteria, Trump influx into our economy, this Trump rally, maybe a wee bit overdone. It could be. Um, also, at the same time, a lot of those commodity stocks are trading at, you know, multi-year lows. And at the beginning of this year, they were at, you know, 10-year lows, even lower than the financial crisis, where basically everybody like, commodities, oh, they're not worth anything anymore. Nobody's ever going to want those things. We're never going to grow and, you know, blah, 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 blah. So... It, I think just the fact that you're a money manager and you're looking around you're like, oh, wow, these things are still at, you know, at, you know, nine multi-year lows. Well, why don't we buy some? So that 
it made sense to start buying the stuff that everybody didn't everybody didn't really already own or like and technology pretty much led the year uh the cues and with uh with just some of the you know kind of the astounding uh rally in the cues and and all of a sudden uh, it's like um everyone noticed that there's other other stocks around so that's what I thought really was the biggest, uh, you know, the Q's had not a bad, let's see, what, on the first of the year, you know, they're trading 107, 118. You had a, what, a 8% rally in the QQQ and plus of the dividend. So, and we're kind of right around the all-time highs here with Apple only sort of participating. Um, Google still off quite, you know, not as much from its uh, recent highs, but um, also, and you had a lot of help from ships. So a lot of like the, the technology was already there. It was already kind of, you know, at better levels. And I think just rest of the rest of the equity world was just catching up a little bit. I think that's sort of that is not totally unreasonable, uh, to be honest. Speaking of catching up, uh, you know, there is a chunk of the equity world that has been doing well, certainly very well in this uh, post-election phrase, or phase, I should say. No, Uncle Mike, this is an area that you, you play in once in a while, at least keep an eye on. This is, of course, uh, the financials, uh, and uh, they've been uh, rally ho mode ever since uh, the election uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which the perhaps looming specter of reduced regulation, something that has certainly been weighing on a lot of the names in this space in terms of the burden of cost and oversight and risk and everything else that, that goes along with increased regulation. So maybe dialing back some of that, uh, those Dodd-Frank reforms, uh, certainly perhaps a, a green light for a lot of these names on the street. We've seen it reflected in a lot of individual names. Of course, uh, the broad ETFs like XLF, our old friend, the Financial Select Spider, up over 10%. Uh, since uh, right around the election period. So been a good time to be in that rally, a good time to be in that ETF, I should say. Bloomberg had an article today saying uh, the SKU is the lowest it's been in uh, in months, uh, which is an indication, of course, that people are not really out there lining up for puts, indicating that perhaps this, uh, this rally has some legs to it, that people aren't uh, perhaps turning around waiting for the other shoe to drop. And Uncle Mike, you, uh, you like to play around in a lot of the... Uh, the XLs, shall we say. Is XLF make it on your radar? And what's your thoughts on all this financials love happening post, uh, post-Trump? post It has made it onto my radar, and it's actually made it into a lot of client portfolios, too. Uh, I actually <clears throat> uh, trimmed a little bit of the gold posi- my gold position, uh, not for everybody, but for a, a handful of clients last week, and added some XLF to it. Uh, I believe that XLF is going to be a good performer. Now, whether or not we get rid of Dodd-Frank, if we uh, cut back the regulations, that may or may not actually happen. But right now, the perception is that we will. And perception rules markets a lot more than reality, unfortunately, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be, if all these regulations are just going to be uh, overturned right away. I think with the new administration, it seems like everything that I can tell, uh, repealing Obamacare or some way of replacing Obamacare appears to be the highest priority. Uh, But with all that in mind, I think it's kind of a perfect storm, so to speak, to be in the financials right now. Uh, In time, I do believe that they will roll back a lot of the regulations. Uh, Let's face it, our new commander in chief really does like leverage with his past business dealings. And... Uh, I believe that in time, he's going to have policies that favor allowing banks to use leverage in one way, shape, or form. Now, uh, whether or not it's going to be just completely getting rid of some regulations or just doing it a little bit or just saying he's going to do it, never doing anything at all, I think that either – Either of those three roads could lead to higher stocks for – or to higher prices for XLF. The other thing that I think is going to help it is that – Interest rates might not come up, but they're, I'm I'm sorry, interest rates might not come up, but they're not going down. And it looks like we are going to have an interest rate increase in the next uh, meeting with the Fed. And if we do continue to raise interest rates, then with that happening, uh, that's only going to be more beneficial to the financials. So uh, I, and I think we do have reason to believe that with a Trump White House and a Yellen Fed, uh, I believe that there could be a lot of re- I think that there is a lot of reason to believe that the Fed would be more apt to raise interest rates uh, with the Trump administration. However, the Fed insists that they're not a political force, but uh, sometimes 
maybe I'm, I'm a little bit cynical in my views. Sometimes I think they are a little bit political. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing how that works out every election cycle where suddenly they sit on their hands and do nothing. And yet they are a, an, an apolitical body, uh, ostensibly. But uh, let's move on from politics, lest we head on down that dark, dark road. Head on into another dark road, this time the dark road through the shady parts of the options market, because it's time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, that funkiest of tunes means it's time once again for the odd block the portion of the show where we break down what is catching our eye out here in the uh, the darker side of the option space the place where your nice happy grandmas and and preschoolers all fear to tread very sensibly uh, i should add because they're lacking fedoras and trench coats like andrew and myself let's kick things off this is a frequent offender or at least it was for a while there in the old odd block i have been welcoming them in a little bit but uh, they're a fun one nonetheless this is good old Vail, ticker symbol Vail, V-A-L-E. This is a metals and mining company. If you're not familiar with them, they produce iron ore and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, they average a fairly hefty amount of volume. They do about 33,000 contracts a day. Today, doing, oh, over... Actually, about for almost exactly, <laughs> or a little bit less than four x that. Just about looks like about thirty three thousand contracts. About two to one, a little more than two to one calls over puts out here today. And if you want to find what drew our attention, it was all the way out to January. Uh, in this case, the uh, regular monthly Januarys. There are weeklies out there. Don't uh, don't look at those. Instead, look. At the Jan 10s, where you'll, where you'll find, excuse me, uh, a lot of paper going up. In particular, a first block that caught our eye of 9,200 of the Jan 10 calls going up. Looks like paper selling for a 31 cents as the day went on. A total of about 13,500, so about 4,000 and change more coming in after that initial block uh, going in. Looks like uh, stock going up uh, aggressively here as well. Uh, so uh, interesting, interesting uh, stuff here. And uh, actually, actually, excuse me, I think I had that backwards. I think the stock, the stock was sold, and I believe the calls were indeed a purchase. At least I hope so, because right now where these calls went out, uh, they're out forty at forty three cents. So if he was uh, selling those, then he's uh, he's wearing it on it a little bit. So this is a buy right, but perhaps not in the way that we saw it, because we also saw, of course, uh, about a quarter of a million shares going up, at least with that initial block. Looks like some more stock went up after the fact as well. So our friend doing it delta neutral, but perhaps uh, the opposite of the way that uh, you may traditionally think here in the odd block where people are used to a lot of size call overriders. Looking back at the year that has been uh, for Vail, it has been a bit of a turbulent one, as you might imagine, starting way off back in the uh, in the doldrums of January, seems like a lifetime ago now, where this thing was trading two bucks, and now fast forward here to November, almost December, and it's trading a whopping nine dollars. So it's been a good year to be uh, riding the Vale train, even if it has been uh, a wee bit bumpy <laughs> along the way. That said, Mr. Rock Lobster, let's kick it off here. What's your thoughts here on these uh, calls and stock in our old friend Vale? Uh, yes, because it went up. Marked buy right, but that usually just means put in stock combination. I'm sorry, call in stock combination. So I think now they put it up with that. Uh, it could be put in stock, but you know, whatever. So um, as long as it's some combination of the two, it looked like it was about delta neutral. I know this huge open just on the strike, but it's <laughs> it's a pretty big chunk of calls to buy at the money. Um, and because the trade kind of went up delta neutral, usually that's not a close. Um, it, it could be, but um, the, just looking at the time and sales from the past, I, I think somebody's looking just for another really big move here into the end of the year. And I don't know what 
besides uh, the current sort of euphoria we have had, what would drive drive it enough to kind of make that thing work? But like we've said in here before, uh, it might not look great, but it still doesn't mean it can't happen. So, I mean, January is fairly long enough uh, for something to happen and, you know, and uh, Valley or Vale um, kind of reminds me somehow of a Dr. Seuss book, The Valley of Vale. It, it does look like a trade deck that could work if you get enough action from the underlying, but it's going to, you know, it's going to take a little bit of take a little bit of work. And this guy's clearly thinking the party is continuing here through at least early uh, 2017 and willing to put some some of his money where his mouth is. And again, if we get a similar performance to what we've seen in the recent past here in Vale or Valley, I like Vale better, too. It just sounds uh, sounds better <laughs> uh, Then our friend here. will be happy. If not, not so much. Uh, that's what the sock leg is for, to help out in those scenarios. All right, uh, let's see. Moving here to, um, to moving on to where we got next. Oh, stick, keeping in uh, kind of the, uh, the, the uh, production mining uh, slash exploration uh, side of the fence. We've got next uh, the S&P Oil and Gas Exploring and Production ETF, ticker symbol XOP. A lot of X's on the show today. Uh, this one closing today, thirty-eight dollars and thirty-three cents off a of buck thirty-four, about a little over three and a half per about three and a half percent on the day. It's a name that does a pretty decent paper, as you might imagine, about a hundred and nine thousand contracts a day, doing three hundred and fifty-eight thousand today, four over one, a little more than that actually, uh, puts over calls, and that should give you some inkling, but not perhaps the entire picture of what we saw out here today, because someone was playing uh for some size out here in uh in the weeklies uh in particular it was the december weeklies expiring on the second so this week uh, that caught our eye it was looks like a bit of actually uh some some premium love paper it looks like they're buying both the dc 41 calls the o2 is so expiring this week as well as the uh, 38 half 35 half uh, put spread doing that for 59 cents and 84 cents, uh, respectively. And looking out here on both of these strikes, a total of, uh, yeah, 10,000 going up on the calls. And actually, yeah, 10,000 on both. So doing it pretty much uh, lockstep with each other. A little bit more maybe going up on the puts after the fact, 11,000 on the 35 half puts. But in general, it looks like paper just uh, getting some, uh, some love on for some very, very near-term premium here in uh in good old xop some of these going up through the offer uh so in fact i think both legs actually going up through the offer so someone had to get it and they had to get it uh quite quite aggressively uh looking uh, open interest i should say is uh is nowhere near what we're looking at here uh on either of these strikes so this is clearly opening paper and going back here a year or so in xop this is another one that has been moving and shaking as you might imagine given a lot of this sector has been moving and shaking all year, hitting its doldrums back in February, and then uh, slowly, inexorably rallying ever since then with some some uh, pits and <laughs> starts along the way. Uh, hitting today, like I said, 38, 33 coming off. It just kind of broke through the 40 handle not that long ago, and now uh, given that up today. But our friend here deciding he wants uh, this bad boy. If it is indeed all premium buying, as it looks like, uh, our friend here wants this thing to rock and roll, and, and he's not messing around, Mr. Rock Lobster. He wants it to rock and roll, and he wants it to rock and roll right now. And at least today's move off nearly 3.5% is a step in the right direction. What's your, what's your uh, take here on our friend uh, gobbling up all the directions, all the premium? He saw the late-night infomercial saying you can make money in any direction using options and uh, any market condition, and he's going to put that to the test this week. I, I, <laughs> doesn't that look... Uh... Because I try to see how that could be an option sale on the put spread and to pay for the calls. Uh, but I just the 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 put per I mean, just the price paid for the spread. I just, you know, because you know how liquidity providers are. They <laughs> if the market is, you know, twenty five fifty, they're not going to pay 50 for them. The customer is, you know, so I don't see how those put spreads could be uh, customer selling. It had to be customer buying. Uh, unless uh, the broker must have loved this customer a whole lot. Um, they did pay up for the 41 calls. Um, so, 
it, it looked, again, it looked, and the puts traded through the bid, so it would make more sense to me to be some sort of a risk reversal. Uh, but that's just not how any of the pricing went up. It just went up as a, like a long call, long put spread strangle. And um, I guess is that is o if there's an OPEC meeting coming out this week, maybe um, maybe that's what they're betting on because XOP is it's had a range of what twenty to forty this year, something like that. So it, it's kind of poised to get to you know a new area. You know, back in the old days, it used to be what a seventy or seventy-five dollar number. So. Um, you know, it very well, it could be somebody is just making a big bet that whatever the OPEC news is, is big. And right now they're looking really big. <laughs> they need uh, they need some pretty good sized prices to make this work. Yeah, they need a bit of a swinging for the fences here and a week to go. Yeah, clearly a, bet, a wager on uh, all things OPEC, I would wager this week. And uh, you're right, I, I would prefer it probably if it was a, a bit of an old risk reversal, but does not appear to have gone up that way. So our friend here... Uh, rolling them bones this week on OPEC, and at least so far, initially, uh, it's heading in the right direction for them. We'll see if this, uh, it's got to go, it's got to pick a direction and go there, and it's got to go there hard, though. It can't do any of this uh, vacillate and can't rally tomorrow and then drop again the next day. It's got to go and go hard, and if that happens, then perhaps our friend will be laughing at us all the way to the bank as we roll on into our final name, our final victim here in uh, in the old odd block, good old uh, Arcelor, Arcelor, Metal. Uh, this is an ADR, as you might imagine, if you're not familiar with it. Closing our ticker symbol MT, uh, closing today about seven and a half, pretty much unched on the day. So it wasn't wasn't underlying that caught our eye today. Didn't really have much of a range today either. It was more uh, some interesting activity out here. This is the name that does. Before we get to that, does about 4,800 contracts a day, doing a little bit more than that, doing 55, nearly 56,000 today. Uh, 75 to one calls over puts. That should tell you all the story pretty much out here. It was a call story, call palooza, call bonanza, call festival, call it what you will, call roll perhaps also <laughs> would apply because it looks like our friend coming out here to play for some size in uh, the D78 call spread, that vertical, again, going up 22,751 times to start the day off. Looks like later on, maybe someone else piling in, or maybe they're adding a little bit more to uh, the D8 leg. Uh, but either way, uh, paper selling, excuse me, the uh, selling the sevens, buying the eights. And there is about 30,000 contracts open on uh, on the seven strike. So it looks like our friend perhaps uh, doing a nice little roll. And where we're priced right now, by right around seven half or right in the midpoint between those two strikes. So might be a good time uh, to keep on rolling to the upside if you are indeed feeling the love kind of interesting obviously sitting on a little bit of house money if he is extending and doing a little bit more size on the upside leg that's always a good sign that you're uh, you're sitting pretty and looking back here on the year that has been for mt and a friend depending on where he opened but if he opened anytime recently he's, he's looking probably pretty happy uh because uh, this thing was trading uh, shy of the seven handle down into the six rings not that long ago like a month ago low sixes even so uh, so if he put it on anywhere on that time frame, he's had a nice run in the underlying that seven that uh, those sevens, I should say, are uh, are looking pretty good. Now, keeping the party rolling all the way on up to the eighths. Uh, another person, Mr. Rock Lobster, who's uh, who's feeling the love and saying, you know what, um, uh, I'm going to keep the love going. I'm actually going to extend the party on the eights. You don't have to go home. You have to just go uh, go to the eight strike and then more of you can come and play. So, uh, so what's your thoughts here on our friend keeping the party rolling here in MT? Yes, didn't it look? Uh, <clears throat> didn't it look a little um, uh, a little happy roll up there? Um, I, I thought it did. Certainly has all the hallmarks of that. Uh, I mean, the calls basically you got a nice little bump here toward the end in MT. Uh, I've seen a lot of this call buying, like in FCX, just a lot of. Metal, steels, copper, all this stuff. And I mean, uh, what a, I mean, even in the October or something, I mean, the thing was only trading like 650, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, um, it ain't anymore. So there's, I think they're just taking the money and going, but there's a, just a lot of this. There is a lot of, you know, when people like, you know, when paper buys calls in this size, 
they're just they they're looking for a lot more upside to catch up. So, you know, an MT is I think it's cl I think it's trading at a year high. Uh, you could have got the company for a song. It used to be like a 50 or 65, 70 dollar stock. Um, I mean, even as late as I'm going to say 2012. Uh, so the commodity prices have really, you know, like they basically ramped up global global glut, whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, even two years ago, it was a thirteen dollar stock. So I think there's, you know, they a lot of these big commodity producers really got hit at some point. The the business cycle will be more friendly for them, and uh, you know, if you didn't get it at the bottom, uh, there's still plenty of room to get it. Um, later so but this obviously is a much more short-term trade why they only rolled to Dees, i don't know um but i guess they just wanted to take their money off the table and say yeehaw but which is pretty much what they did all right everybody let's keep the party rolling ourselves it's monday it means it's time for your questions time to keep on rolling right on into the mail block It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. I was getting people telling us that there were some issues here with uh, the Mixler stream. Let's see if that is uh, working now. I know I was, I was trying to check it during the thing, and it kept saying we're off air. So if you're having problems getting in, uh, try it <laughs> well, if you're not listening to live hopefully but uh, try it again now we'll put out a tweet to that effect too and uh, hopefully oh there it is catching in on all of our devices so apparently the stream was just uh, just a little bit wonky so uh, if you couldn't join us before <laughs> welcome in now live a little bit late but actually perfect timing because uh, it is time for the trading block excuse me the mail block and uh, if you guys have questions hit us up you know how to do so, including ad options on Twitter or stock twits, or indeed those of you who now could get the stream working <laughs> via Mixler, as well as, of course, all the other. I was wondering why no one really was in the chat room. I thought something maybe people weren't as loving the show today, but it was uh, technical, technical difficulties. <laughs> people are still people are still uh, hung over over there on the old tryptophan after the long holiday weekend. All right, let's get to it. Lots of your questions uh, to pile into. Let's see how many we could squeeze in on uh, today's epic Monday uh, extravaganza post-holiday here. Uh, let's kick things off actually with a bit of a recap. Uh, we asked you guys last week, uh, we said, hey, uh, really popular, one uh, popular uh, question of the week, one of our more popular ones we've done in a little bit. Uh, everyone weighing in on their favorite uh, their favorite uh, strategy. You guys, Uncle Mike and Rock Lobster, both, I believe, picked uh, the vertical slash ratio vertical to be the winner of our poll, but you were oh so incorrect. It was actually <laughs> the covered call slash short put taking, a, taking a, a squeaker with just about exactly a third of the vote, following by, followed by number two, the Iron Condor slash Iron Fly, and number three, uh, the vertical slash ratio vertical. So 33%, then 28%, then 24%, and an anemic 15% coming in for the straddle or strangle. Did those results surprise you at all, Uncle Mike or the Rock Lobster? I know you guys are both, both pulling for the vertical. Uh, I think on behalf of the Rock Lobster, we both demand recounts and claim umbrage. Are you guys both are you guys both <laughs> moving to Wisconsin? Is that what's happening now? Yes. <laughs> All right, we'll get indeed. We're getting political here. Before we do that, let's get into uh, today's question of the week, uh, which just went live a little bit before the show, and uh, we're asking you a little bit different question this week. We're asking you, hey, you know, a lot of action out there on the commodity front, a lot of volatility, uh, depending on where you're looking. Uh, so we say, hey, what's your what's your option of choice out there on the commodity land? We gave you a bunch of different choices, options, if you will. Uh, we said uh, GLD or the big COMEX gold options. It could be USO or WTI options. We can go rates or TLT and euro dollar or the 10 years. Or maybe you're an FX guy. So you like euro USD or the pound USD. Those are our four choices. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, let's start with you. What is your choice? I think I know the answer, but and we didn't include one of your favorites on there. I knew that would give you umbrage, but it was too broad. But uh, what is your choice and what do you think is winning our poll? Uh, well, I got to go with GLD because that's the one that I actually do use. And uh, uh, the reason for that, of course, is that uh, GLD actually has a pretty good correlation to gold itself. So 
Uh, I'm going with GLD. <clears throat> and I will say that our audience selected USO uh, because of the movement of oil recently. And Mr. Mr. Rock Lobster, same question for you, sir. Which one is your choice and which you think is winning? Um, oh, the for, for commodities, I think... Uh, I just think GLD would be winning, um, but I would I would rather look at I think because TLT I think has a lot more room right now, uh, even with although they're like more it's a little more esoteric or the dollar you know or the euro dollar um, either one of those two but I don't think either of those is when I think gold is. Gold is the headliner. <laughs> TLT, a little too esoteric. You are correct. Only an anemic 5% choosing uh, the TLT euro dollar tenure. I kind of figured out. I figured that might, might do a little bit better than uh, the uh, currencies, but currencies actually winning, or not winning, but doing better with 14%. Uh, but the winner, it was earlier, was, uh, was uh, USO and WTI running away with it, about half of the vote, but now more votes have come in, and it's only a third, 30, about a little more than a third, 36% of the winner so far is uh, Comex Gold slash GLD with uh, 45%. Uncle Mike, I thought for sure you'd take Umbridge. We didn't include XLE in there as well. Well, I was going to take Umbridge. You didn't put in uh, SPY. But I guess, well, it's commodities, so I guess that, you can't. That's not really, doesn't meet my uh, definition of commodity. Right, sorry, you did say commodities. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you can do the rut. maybe in the paradise on earth that is St. Charles, that's a commodity, but uh, for most of us, it's not. So, my uh, apologies, I just remember you said <laughs> right. So, yeah, so far, uh, Uncle Mike's pick, uh, GLD, winning as Andrews, even though Andrew was holding out some love for the TLT. Still got a week to go, so uh, if, you, if you don't like those choices, uh, hit us up. If you want to vote for something else, if you want to do a write-in, go ahead. Some of you guys also writing in last week for debit spreads uh, to be added to the mix. Even though we had verticals, we didn't specify credit or debit. We didn't get that granular, but um, that's another one. And also outright buy. Some of you wanted those on there as well. So we like when you guys give us your uh, your additions to uh, to the old program. All right, moving on here to question from uh, from Marco. He says trading on election night was. Was horse poopy to keep it uh, family friendly. What can an options trader do when the futures are plummeting but the options aren't open? So frustrating. Well, this is this is a, a frequent refrain. We usually hear this during uh, during earnings season. People write in with, "Hey, I had Google calls or Amazon puts or whatever the case may be," and the underlying was rocking and rolling in the after hours. And they kind of had to sit there on their hands and watch while uh, the stock guys played and everyone else. But they couldn't play because they were options people and they had to wipe away a single tier. And now we're hearing <laughs> hearing a similar refrain, but this time for uh, for the big index uh, futures, uh, which is a little bit of a different game and uh, one that could be often frustrating to a lot of newcomers uh, to this space who are not used to this and not used to the rules. And, of course, you're getting into futures, and the index indexes on the futures. They have different trading hours, and the options have different hours. So it's kind of a whole whirlwind uh, of crazy stuff. Uh, maybe, Mr. Rock Lops, you guys have probably touched on this, I'd imagine, in your chat room in the past. So we'll start with that. What do you counsel to our poor, uh, upset friend Marco, as well as to your mentees and clients out there when they come to you and say, hey, uh, everything's hitting the fan in the after hours and uh, I can't trade my options. What's a man to do? <laughs> I can't trade my options. Um, so a lot of our clients trade the E-mini after hours um, and either on spec or, you know, you can kind of beta weight it a little bit uh, for how much uh, exposure you want, depending on what your position is. Um so that's a possibility, and those are because uh, it's a CFTC. It's a little more margin friendly, um, and there's and there is some VIX depending on you know when in the after hours, but VIX futures. But that's not going to give you you know, that's not going to give you exactly what you want, obviously. Um, but um, you know there those are um, those are some vehicles. That could help you. And that's also why I like puts in stock or calls in stock because it allows you to unwind part of the equity position in the after hours if, instead of an all option position. That would be my second one. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, one thing to learn is that sometimes futures and futures options can be a little bit scary if you've never used them before. Uh, if you take maybe an hour or two to educate yourself on how uh, – 
options on the S and P E mini and the similarities of the differences between them of SPY. Uh, long story short, a one lot on the E mini is the same as a five lot on SPY. Uh, so in terms of doing your ratios as to how they would work, you can trade options 24 hours or 23 and a half hours or whatever it is on the E-mini. Uh, they're not super liquid, but they are, they're, they're, they're very good. I should say they're, I don't think they're quite as liquid as SPY, but it's been a few years since I've traded the E-mini options. Uh, so I would suggest, uh, actually opening up a futures account if overnight trading is a concern of yours because that gives you the ability to do it heck if you'd have bought the low on election night you'd be a very wealthy man right now well there were no futures left because as we all know carl icon gobbled them all up and then uh, oh, announced yeah, it to the world right. amazing how that works when you you beat your chest about the ones that supposedly uh, work in your favor but yeah you know we don't talk a lot of underlying here on the show because it is the option block after all but don't be afraid uh, of slinging a little a little underlying, particularly in those less liquid times like the after hours when that's kind of your only option, a pun intended, except for a few, uh, you know, a few exo exoteric uh, international products. So if you want to trade the indices and the futures are rocking and rolling, then the futures are where you got to play. Thankfully, a lot of the brokers have made that problem, that issue of opening an additional futures account. They made it much more seamless now. It's kind of you click one more button. On, uh, on a tab in your brokerage account, you virtually sign a couple of, click a couple of forms, click, click, you know, bam, and it's pretty much done. And if the interface is all pretty much seamless, even if they are separate accounts, it kind of appears to you as one account. So that's been a big stumbling block for people in the past. Thankfully, a lot of those issues have gone away. But if you're not comfortable slinging uh, the futures, I got, Uncle Mike has a good point. I think the E-mini is a, a very retail-friendly uh, place to play. Uh, and size-wise, at least, uh, maybe still rocks and rolls in the after hours, like the big stuff. But at least size-wise, you're not going to get as run over as if you're diving into the big, uh, big S and P futures out there. All right, we got a um, comment here from uh, Chris Brecher. He's uh, he's commenting on your comments from uh, I think it was last week's show, Mr. Rock Lobster, where you were talking about the big run-up in uh, in dry shippers out there, DRYS. And uh, you were saying that it was perhaps due to some uh, some legalization actions here in the states were driving that. And he's maybe taking a dissenting view. He says, maybe if I was high, I would have believed all the bull flags on the way up. Or maybe it sounds like he's just got sour grapes that he wasn't buying it along the way. Either way, sir, perhaps uh, perhaps poo-pooing or lamenting your notion of what was actually driving uh, dry ships on the way up, sir. Uh, you know, it's quite okay to poo-poo what was going on because it's back to five bucks and it, it went up to a hundred. <laughs> I just think it was an old fashioned short squeeze and it is somebody had a really bad day. <laughs> somebody covered above $90. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess, I guess you could have the greatest idea in the world. It just has to be wrong for, you just have to. It, the idea just has to be wrong for longer than you have money to cover the position for, which apparently somebody had. So, yeah, there were rumors. It was enough to start a little speculative buying, and then that just became something else. <laughs> so um, it actually used to be an interesting trader for a while, but I haven't, I haven't really looked at it in probably three or four years. And that has been about the last time because all the shippers are just they're just suffering from overcapacity, which is why everybody's shorting the stocks. They all they all bought too many ships, and uh, they're the global trade kind of slowed down or didn't grow fast enough to um, it didn't grow fast enough to support all the uh, you know all the stuff that was out there. But you know. I'm glad if he was high, he would have believed all the bull signals. Yes, but. and he would have bought it, and he would have been a happy man. So, therefore, his uh, his lack of using, therefore, apparently cost him money. So, there you go. Maybe for all the anti-advocates, there's a there's a, there's a a point against you. All right, <laughs> if we believe what our friend here has to say. All right, let's see. We've got people flocking into the chat room now. I feel bad they couldn't listen all show long because I want to make sure I get a couple of questions from them in. we got Real RK, our friend there, chiming in. Um, he says, what do you guys think about a small, long vol?" I guess he means position here with uh, the oil related volatility recount, et cetera. He says, Hey, you're, it says you're off the air, but I see the link. Now it's working. Yeah, it's working. Don't worry. You can get in there now. Um, so yeah. Uh, what do we think about a small long vol position here? We were talking at the top of the show 
you know, obviously uh, the VIX cash hovering around that 13 handle, mildly off its lows of recently, but still still well on the low end of its recent range. The futures pricing in a little bit more than that, but not aggressively. So certainly not as uh, disparate as we've seen uh, in uh, other periods out there, but still pricing in a little bit more. So be Larry, obviously, when you're looking out there and saying, oh, how vol is so cheap. Also be Larry. I mean, I obviously you don't specify where you're talking your long vol, uh, but, you know, not all products are the same. And as we were just talking on our long and short of futures options that today, if you get on the commodity side of the fence, it's a different ball game. Uh, oil vol is kind of elevated right now compared to recent weeks and months, uh, whereas gold vol is actually kind of coming off a spike and now kind of in the middle of that range. So I guess it kind of depends where you're looking at uh, gobbling up that vol. But let's say, let's say, let's say you're just talking uh, plain old vanilla, go out and buy some, uh, some S&P options, get some long vol in your portfolio. Uncle Mike, what say you to that idea right now? Well, I mean, I'd rather be a buyer than a seller in general, but for the most part, uh, I'm more of a, how do I put this? I'm more leaning towards buying on my SPY options than I am in terms of being a, uh, I'm leaning more towards buying calls as opposed to selling puts, if that makes any sense at this stage. Uh, in terms of taking a position on it, it's at a lower end of its range. But I just want to remind everybody of a story uh, from back in 2008. I remember just almost missing my plane when these new VIX options were out there that no one really understood how to trade. And uh, I almost missed my plane because everybody wanted to get short the VIX. The VIX was at 38. And how could VIX possibly go any higher it has to go lower it's so high right now and hopefully the crowd didn't do what they were talking about doing because the vix of course went up to 80 so just because it's low doesn't mean it can't go lower mr rock lobster are you a vol buyer or vol seller here s p at the money straddle buy or sell go oh God. <laughs> that that old that old Did chestnut I, <laughs> what, uh, th- this week right now that, this the- minute this minute what you doing I'm twisting Real RK's question on his head a little bit just for fun. All right. Uh, I, I could buy three week out options. So I wouldn't buy this week's volatility, but I think I could buy three week volatility where it is right now. There you go. I didn't give you that disclaimer, but I'll allow you to make an addendum. So I kind of just, just threw you under the bus there for the entertainment of our listeners. By the way, Real RK clarifying, he says he wants VXX call spreads. Uh, so not going in the VIX futures or S&P options straight up. He wants to go more in the ETF realm. Uh, he wouldn't want to sell vol and oil because it could go higher. I, I feel you there. Um, uh, all kinds of good stuff, everybody. Again, I apologize. More of you couldn't get in to get your questions in earlier. Uh, blame the ever-loving technology out there. We'll make sure uh, it, we'll make sure we try to find out what happened and we'll fix it for you for Thursday's show. Meanwhile, we're going to keep on rolling right on into Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block. Uh, like the man said, this is the portion of the show where we tell you what's on our radar uh, for the rest of this week into the weekend. We kind of touched on the big things, or at least one of the big things coming up this week. Of course, you have the OPEC meeting, excuse me, later on this week on Wednesday, I believe, and then later on to close the week out, we have the return of our old friend. It's a new month. That means non-farms on the horizon. We'll see if this is perhaps the final final bit of uh, of weaponry, the final bit of, of arsenal that the Fed needs to arm themselves for the, as many people expect, the rate increase to come in December, or who knows, perhaps this will uh, this will be not as bullish as the last few non-farms, and that'll throw a wrench into those works at the very last minute, which would be kind of odd. It'd be, we're in this kind of weird scenario now where almost it seems like it's baked in the rate, ri- rate increase, at least a modest one, and uh, if we have any sort of unseating of that maybe the non-farms aren't as bullish as people think this friday we might actually have a a, a, you know a sell-off on our hands which is kind of an odd scenario we talked about this before in some of the few other areas when we've been close to close to fed meetings and it seems like the market was poised for something but we are in one of those weird times again where yeah if non-farms doesn't deliver then we might actually have a sell-off kind of weird uh let's start with you uncle mike Uh, i know you're watching opec you're watching non-farms anything else uh, catching your eye or on your radar this week uh, not particularly. I mean, I want to see if we can still hold 2100 on SPX. Uh, the old all-time high that we had staring us in the face was, I believe, 2093. So uh, curious to see if we can still hold 2100. 
I know Andrew made his extra bold prediction last week of the two point increase that the SPX would have, and uh, he it held true for him. And uh, I was right. Oh, he was. He really went out on, on, on quite the limb there for that. But uh, looking at that, but I would say 2100 and 2093 are the key numbers with which I am looking at for this week. I should apologize to all of our listeners out there who are hoping for a, a breaking recap of the uh, the Thor Industries earnings after the bell. We did not do that one. There are some names still reporting this week, including everyone's favorite bellwether of the market. Thor Industries closing 90 and a half and actually knocking out of the park today, up about nearly 7% here in the after hours. So maybe we should have talked about them. But there were other things to talk about, like whatever is on the Rock Lobster's radar for the rest of the week, sir. Well, we do have a non-farm payroll number. Uh, we have on a bunch of Italians voting uh, to keep this populist vote going on Sunday. Uh, we've got a little oil and... Mostly, I'm just looking at more, act, seeing if there's a little more activity, and I think the commodity stuff. I'd like to see the vol get a little cheaper to be interesting for more long-term purchases. I stuck my finger in a little bit, but I wouldn't mind seeing uh, that vol get a whole lot cheaper. Um, then I could be real confident in the rally if everybody just starts writing calls, over, overriding calls like crazy to crush the vol. So. But so far, those are those are the things that we are looking at or looking at an option pit right now. You think Thor Industries makes a product called the Mjolnir? That would be awesome. <laughs> I don't know anything <laughs> about them, except they have a great name. And uh, and the ticker symbol isn't Thor, though, unfortunately. It's just T-H-O. Not as fun. So they lose a point, a demerit there for Thor Industries. But next time, maybe next time, the next cycle, we'll have breaking news on all things Thor for you. But that's going to do it for this uh, episode this truncated by technology episode. Glad for thanks to all of you guys who uh, who fought through the issues to join us here. Uh, if, I feel better now. I was like, why? Why does no one love us this week? But it was just it was just the technology. So uh, we'll make sure whatever they did, we'll fix it and we'll make sure it works for Thursday. But before we go, uh, one last time, let me check back in with my cohorts, my partners in crime. Let's start off. Let's start off with Uncle Mike this time. What's cooking in the land of our, all things RCM? All slash futures slash going long. Well, in between your lightning deals that you're getting on Amazon today, hopefully, uh, feel free to contact me if you are looking for a financial advisor to help you into the year end. Uh, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Most people's portfolios about wash sales, about tax sales, and about different things that you need to know. Uh, and uh, I fear not when someone mentions the word call spread or put spread. Uh, I actually do work with options. It's a rarity in the financial advisory world. So feel free to contact me at 312-212-3531 or shoot me an email at mtusa at rcmfs.com. And Uncle Mike, excuse me, and Rock Lobster. <laughs> Take umbrage at that, if you will. Uh, what's cooking in the land of our all things option pit? All things option pit. Uh, we have a December 10th will be our interest rate class for options. Check that out. That will be one of our Saturday classes. If you're an Option Pit Live subscriber above, it's free. And um, that's that's basically it. And look for our uh, our volatility trading class will be coming uh, out uh, in the first quarter of 2017. There you go. Check it out, listeners. OptionPit.com. To learn more, just head on over to the borders of Maine and then knock on the door and ask for Andrew, and he'll answer it. And he'll give you his private one-on-one -on -one tour of all things lobster, lobster not, not even lobster bisque, lobster mousse. So check it out if you are so inclined. And on behalf of The Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing, all the usual fun stuff, including grabbing our mobile app. And we'll see you all next time for more The Option Block.
The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.